A happy Thursday, everybody. A good Erev Shabbos. Welcome to the pre-Shabbos sermon for Parshas Boy. Subject, the topic today is, so what's so great about 70 years? We know that this Shabbos, we are going to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Rebbe's accepting officially his leadership. Uh, it's with 70 years ago that the Rebbe officially accepted. 71 years ago, the previous Rebbe passed away and the Rebbe kind of defaulted into the leadership position. But it was a year later only that he accepted the position. And so we're celebrating 70 years. This begs the question, so what's so special about 70 years? Where have we seen 70 years before? We have seen 70 years before in the following episode. In the Passover Haggadah, in the Pesach Haggadah, we have a story that is celebrating, that is celebrating the swearing in of a new president. In the Pesach Haggadah, we have the swearing in of a new president. What's the story? So in Washington, we understand there's the swearing in of a new president and everybody's worried what's gonna to happen today, what's he gonna to do today? Yeah, what matters is not what he did today, not what he did yesterday, not what he did on the day of the swearing in. The thing that matters is what is he doing in the first 100 days? Yeah, the first 100 days is where he has like this blank check and everybody is willing to give him whatever he wants. Uh, with uh, hope and prayers that he's going to be successful and to lead the country in a good direction. The first 100 days is like a, is like a blank check. We're, we're very patient in the first 100 days because the president has momentum and he can use that momentum to achieve great things. We see a similar story yeah, among the leadership of the Jewish people where a president was replaced and a new president was sworn in. When we read this week's parsha, we read about the final three plagues that Hashem struck Egypt with, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, and the plague of the passing of the firstborn, killing of the firstborn. And we can already smell, yeah, you can already taste the matzah and you can already smell the bitter herbs. Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. It's, it's Pesach is here, we're already starting. Well. In the Pesach story, in the Passover Haggadah, there is a description, something that took place on the day that a new president was sworn in. What happened there? It was in the, in the era just after the destruction of the second temple and the Jewish leadership had moved to a city called Yavne, yeah, the local girls' high school is named for that city, Yavne v'chachameho. And the leader of the Jewish people at the time was a descendant of Hillel, as they all were meant to be, descendants of Hillel. The Jewish leadership, the prince, the, the presidency of the Jewish community belonged to the family of Hillel. And his great, 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 great grandson, his name was Gamliel of Yavne. He, when he was appointed the leader after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, he took a very, very strict approach to a disciplined approach, and he demanded obedience and uniformity among the rabbis who were his colleagues on the leadership board of the Jewish people, because he was very concerned that after the destruction and the darkness and the, the, the many challenges that the Jewish people had undergone in those, in those years, that the leadership and the adherence to the Torah was going to fall apart. It was going to be diminished, dwindle, fragment, and disappear. And therefore, he demanded absolute conformity among his colleagues. And this came to a head when he picked a fight with a great sage named Rabbi Yehoshua. It was his senior. Rabbi Yehoshua had many, many students among the leadership of the Jewish people. Rabbi Shua was a beloved and gentle, loving leader. And it happened once that there was a debate in the study hall, in the Jewish, uh, in the boardroom. And Rabbi Yeshua ruled one way and Rabbi 
Gamliel of Yavne ruled the, the other way, and Rabbi Gamliel demanded that Rabbi Yeshua stand up in front of all the students and recant his opinion, and instead declare that he agrees with Rabbi Gamliel, that he agrees with the majority position, I guess. Again, Rabbi Gamliel was not being malicious. He was trying his best to maintain to maintain the, the Jewish community or the Jewish leadership. This was seen as bullying by the colleagues of Rabbi Gamliel who were dear students of Rabbi Yeshua. And they demanded that Rabbi Gamliel of Yavne be removed from his position. Such a harsh person, such a person who treats Rabbi Yeshua, a beloved and venerated sage who treats Rabbi Yeshua so harshly, cannot, cannot keep that post. He can't be the president of the academy, can't. So who are we going to put instead? They found, they found somebody, a person with great yichas. Yichas means he comes from a good family. He was descended from Ezra, who has his own book in the Tanakh, in the Torah. He has his own book in the Bible. And uh, he himself was wealthy and a tremendous scholar. Very, very good candidate. His name is Rabbi Eliez, Elo, Rabbi Elozer ben Azariah. Rabbi Elozer, the son of Azariah. So they came to him with a request, please step into the role of president of the academy. And Rabbi Elozer says, let me go home and talk to my wife. He comes home. <clears throat> And uh, they discuss it together. They discuss the cost of being the president. Can you imagine the cost of having, a, having your spouse in politics is very, very heavy. It's very, very costly, uh, emotional health, et cetera, and so on. And uh, but she comes up with a, a very sim simple argument, a very obvious point. She says to him, my friend, wh who's going to listen to you? You're a, pardon, you, 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 excuse me for my language, but you're a pisher. You're 18 years old. He was at the time, 18 years old, freshly married, freshly out of yeshiva. He was blessed by God with a tremendous head. But who's gonna listen to you? Who's gonna take you seriously? When you pound on the table and say, shh, the president wants to speak now, <laughs> who's gonna be quiet for you? It's gonna be a joke, you can't do this. And the Belazar ben Azariah went to bed thinking his wife is right, of course. And in the morning, he will go back to the academy and refuse the position. Wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror. He sees an old man looking back at him. There's an old man in the mirror looking at him. He says, what's this? He has in his beard. His beard became a long white beard. He had 18 strands of, of, of white in his beard. He says, aha, if Hashem is going to do this to me overnight, or you could say that just, you know, <laughs> just thinking about communal leadership in the Jewish community can turn a guy's white beard, a beard white. Could say that, but, <laughs> but seriously, Hashem made, for, made a miracle for me and turned my beard white and made me look so, what's it called? So venerable, so stately. This is obviously a sign that I'm supposed to take this position and that Hashem wants me there. And so now he gets to say on his, oh, he gets to come back to the academy and make his declaration. I'm ready to take the position of president of the academy, leader of the Jewish people. And there is the crowning ceremony or the swearing in ceremony. And then they sit down and he starts enacting enactments. First rule, open the doors. There's a debate among the sages whether they added 400 or 800 be benches, 300 or 800 benches that day to the academy. Rabbi Gamliel was very, very uh, careful who he allowed into the academy. And Rabbi Lezim and Azariah said, any Jew who wants to study Torah should be allowed to study Torah. And so students came running. And then he did another thing on that first day. And this is the confusing thing. 
And this is what we quote him as saying in the Passover Pesach Haggadah. In the readings that we do at the Seder, <coughs> we, we quote Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah as saying the following. This is one of the things that he did on his first day in office. He said, I am like a 70 year old man. And I have always hoped to enact a law to have the exodus from Egypt mentioned in our liturgy at night. I have not been successful in this effort. But uh, a colleague, Ben Zoyma, came to my aid and he found a, he found a, a, an illusion. He found a clue in the Torah's own words. And that, that way we got to enact that principle that I was always hoping to enact that we should mention the exodus from Egypt at night. When do we mention the exodus from Egypt at night? So in the Shema, famous, the Shema Yisrael Hashem Elikein Hashem Echad. And then there is the paragraph about loving Hashem with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then there's the paragraph about what happens if we do not listen, punishments. And what happens if we do listen, blessings, a commitment to fulfill all the commands of the Torah. And then there's a third paragraph that describes the command of wearing tzitzis. Yeah, the talis. And the closing sentence of that paragraph is, I am God, your God, who took you out of Egypt to be your God. That's called mentioning Egypt every day. And until the time that Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah became the president, that third paragraph was skipped at night. They would only say the opening statement, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekein Hashem Echad. And then they would do, read the first paragraph about loving Hashem with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And then they would read the paragraph about the mitzvahs, and then they would stop. They did not mention, they did not read the third paragraph at night. And Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah had pushed that they should, because you have to, in his opinion, you have to mention the exodus from Egypt, not only during the daytime, but also at night. Yeah. What's interesting is that with all his momentum his, in his uh, inauguration ceremony and in his first hundred days, he could not get it through by himself. He could not get the legislation passed among his colleagues. They weren't listening to him. They were not backing him up. It took Ben Zoymo to convince the crowd. Yeah. And then Ben Zoymo, and then Rabbi Lazar Ben Azariah adds to his uh, statement that we quote in the Seder, he says, and my colleagues, the wise men, the chachamim, the scholars, the sages, they say, they added to Ben Zayma's, uh, they added to Ben Zayma's commentary. Ben Zayma said, it says in the Torah, you have to remember the day that you left Egypt, all the days of your life. Why do you say all the days of your life? Should say, you have to remember the exodus from Egypt um, throughout your life. All the days of your life means including the nighttime, during the day and at night. And here come the sages and they say, no, all the days of your life means in this lifetime and in your lifetime in the world to come. So obviously here come the questions. Questions come popping up now. This, first of all, this is what the president of the Jewish people, the Jewish, the leadership of the Jewish people has to deal with on his first day in office. This is the most pressing issue that he has to deal with. The, the Holy Temple was burned just a few years before. There's now an upheaval and a crisis in the leadership of the Jewish people. A president has been impeached and a new president has been installed. At that time, in those very days, the 10 martyrs that we read about in the Yom Kippur liturgy, they are being tortured and killed in a manner that the world had never seen before. This is what he's busy with. This is what's worrying him. This is on the top of his mind. This couldn't wait a year or two till he settled into office and took care of business. 
And we're not talking about a frivolous rabbi who didn't enact anything important. Rabbi Leza ben Azariah put together some of the most important principles of the Torah. Like for example, the principle that, uh, that to save a life overrides the laws of Shabbos. Those are his words, and we quote them incessantly. This was an important rabbi. But the first thing he's worried about is whether we're mentioning the exodus from Egypt at night. And why does he mention his opponents? Why does he bring up the opposing, <laughs> why is he bringing up the, uh, the opposing view of the other sages? He brings up his supporting uh, colleagues, right? Ben Zoyma, he supported me. He found a way to learn it out of the words of the Torah. But why is he bringing up the Chachamim? The other sages who are arguing with him, why is he bringing them up? Why is he quoting them? Well, <laughs> that's the question. What a way to start your presidency. Obviously, Rabbi Elizabeth ben Azariah is a very serious leader. He took his position very seriously. And this statement had something to do with the pressing needs of the Jewish people at that time. He was not messing around. But we have to understand this. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, it was Parsha Shmois in the year 1992. The Rebbe gave an incredible explanation to help us understand Rabbi Loza ben Azariah's statements and what is so special about the number 70. Again, we stand now just a few, two days before Yud Shvat, which is the anniversary, the 70th anniversary of the Rebbe's ascension to leadership of the Lubavitch movement of the Jewish world. And, and it's an incredible and holy and auspicious day. And on the other hand, yeah, we're still, we're still wounded, afflicted by all the challenges of our era. Yeah, it's winter. The snow is falling. A lot of us have been isolated for a long, long time. And even those of us that have not been isolated, even when you go out and you meet people, you can't shake a hand, you can't hug a friend. Tremendous loneliness, tremendous distance between people. The Rebbe gives us an insight into the number 70 and into the statements of Rabbi Eloza ben Azariah that are like a compass for us in these, in these times. Like, a, like an arrow pointing us in the right direction, like a, a poignant call to action. Rabbi Eloza ben Azariah intended to breathe life into the dried up bones of the Jewish people. The circumstances of his inauguration to the presidency, yeah, you can imagine were, were a contradiction. On the one hand, you can imagine that a huge group of Jews gathered together to watch the inauguration. Yeah, an exciting event. It's almost like a, a holiday. At the same time, we're talking about Jews who were so full of sorrow, so depressed, broken, despairing. And the contradictions are spinning around in their heads. The, the greatest leaders of the Jewish people are being brutally murdered. And we're putting another guy into the seat of authority. We're celebrating the appointment of a president. We are, we're, we are celebrating renewal when the end is almost upon us? Will there even be Jews left in the world in 50 years from now, in 70 years from now, in 100 years from now? In response to this, the new president, Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah, he stands up and he declares, people, we must mention the exodus from Egypt at night, it's imperative that we not be alarmed by the nighttime, that we should not let the darkness deter us from our path, that even in the doom and gloom and the depths of pain, we have to mention and remember 
we have to bring to mind the exodus from Egypt. We have to remind ourselves that this was exactly the way it worked during the times of the exodus from Egypt. It was from the darkness, from the, the, the more intense the pain became, the closer the Jewish people were to their redemption. The natural inclination is to think that redemption grows in the daylight when everybody is supportive and everybody is helping and everybody is nurturing this redemptive process. That's when good things grow. That's when salvation sprouts and, and, uh, and uh, comes to save the people. It's not so. It's not so. Rabbi Elizabeth and Azariah is reminding the people their redemption the first time grew in darkness. It grew in the pain and in the gloom. It was specifically in those very dark moments of the exile in Egypt, when the Jewish people, the, every Jew had lost his self-confidence, he had lost any sense of self-worth. They were in the depths of despair. That's when, that's when the miracles began to take place. When being a Jew came at a high price, when being a Jew and observing the mitzvahs required incredible, irrational perseverance and stubbornness. That's when it's a mitzvah to remember the exodus from Egypt. Where did Rabbi Lezer learn this from? How did he discover this principle? How did he learn that salvation grows specifically in the nighttime, in the darkness? Maybe. Maybe he got it from the actual story of the Exodus from Egypt that we're reading in this week's Torah portion. Or the Pesach Seder that reflects the Exodus from Egypt that we're going to read about in this week's Parsha. What do we have at the Seder? We have a similar dichotomy. We have a similar contradiction in the events, in the, in the customs and practices of the Seder. Right? It says in the Shulchan Aruch, that you're supposed to drink four cups of wine. Why are we drinking four cups of wine? To celebrate our freedom. A free man drinks wine. Yeah, water is for horses. <laughs> At the same time, the Shulchan Aruch says, the wine should be red to remind us of the blood spilled by Pharaoh. Celebrating the good experiencing the pain of the darkness. Another example, in the Haroset. The Haroset is meant to remind us of the apple trees that the Jewish ladies would have their babies in, 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 in Egypt. They didn't have to go to a hospital and they didn't have to call a midwife. They were birthing their children pain-free in delightful, warm, sunny, uh, vacation spots under the apple trees. And then miracle of miracles, they would leave their babies in the fields and Hashem would nourish them. Yeah, this is a celebration of the, one of the greatest miracles of the whole experience of the Jewish people in Egypt. And at the same time, what is it supposed to remind us of? This haroset that's made of apples and nuts. It's meant to be a gray and coarse texture to remind us of the clay that the Jewish people were forced to use in making the bricks of their slavery. Why this contradiction? And the, the painful answer is because redemption grows in the darkness, specifically in those awful times. The cries of the Jewish people, the prayers of the Jewish people have the strength to shake the heavens and allow the wishes and the prayers to reach the highest places and be answered. Exactly when it feels like the end, that's when it can become, that's when we can start having the beginning. Rabbi Lezab and Azariah made that proclamation, but that wasn't enough. He said, I also have to tell you what my opponents have said. I have to tell you that my opponents have added to my declaration. They've added even more oomph. How? They said not only 
Do we have to remember in our current pain that in the past there was salvation that grew out of pain? I want to tell you what my colleagues are saying, that the whole past and present is a direct road, a smooth path to the ultimate salvation, the days of Mashiach. Not only does the pain uh, bear the promise of previous redemptions, both the previous pain and redemption and our current struggles are paving the way to the greatest redemption that has ever happened. This is really the job of a president, of a leader, to find the future in this moment, to find the greatness of this moment, to find the potential that's hidden in this moment and to connect this moment with the future. In Hebrew, how do you say president? Nasi. Nasi is from the word hisnasus, which means to be higher, to be exalted, to rise above, because the job of the Nasi is to look at things in the big picture from above, take a bird's eye view and see how today's issues are the road to tomorrow's solutions. He, the leader cannot, the president, the Nasi, he cannot worry about the immediate feelings of despair and fear. He can't afford it. He has to look into the future and see how the night itself is bringing about the dawn. Here's a story. Rabbi Sima Jacobson tells a story about his father that uh, his father was a media man. He was the editor-in-chief of a Yiddish newspaper in New York. And therefore he had what to Chabad in those days in the 70s was a tremendous asset. He had a media pass into the Soviet Union, which meant he could get in and out as he pleased and they weren't checking his bags. That meant that he made many, many trips back and forth, back and forth from New York to the Soviet Union, smuggling tefillin, prayer books, <coughs> Torah books, Jewish paraphernalia to the Jews that were locked away behind the Iron Curtain. After one such trip, he was called into the Rebbe's office to, uh, for a debriefing. And he reviewed with the Rebbe all the, the suffering, the anxiety, all the, the awful experiences of the Hasidim, the Jewish people left back in, in the Soviet Union. Here, they closed down the mikveh. Here, they closed down the Jewish school, the underground school. Here, they arrested somebody, a chassid, and they sent him off to Siberia. Here, a family was left without their breadwinner. And with every report, the Rebbe's face becomes more and more pained. His expression falls, and he's looking sadder and sadder. And then this interview lasted all night. He gave a full detailed report. When the sunlight of the morning starts peeking through the Rebbe's window into his office, the Rebbe sits up, moves over to go, walks over to the window, pulls back the window shades and peace replaces the pain on his face. And he says, ah, a new day. That's the power of a leader. That's the job of a leader. Yeah, perhaps you could say what the Rebbe was saying in his own, in his own thoughts behind the Rebbe's words is the darkness of the night, the pain and the agony all leads to a new day. It's not like the morning is a brand new development that happens once the darkness is, is, is cleared away. No, the darkness leads to the, to, the, to the light. The darkness leads to the salvation. That's a leader, the ability not to get depressed, not to despair, to remain connected to the faith in the eternal value of every moment, of every experience. Rabbi Lezab ben Azari was not naive. He knew exactly the era, the period of Jewish history that he was living in. 
He knew how hard it was. He knew how difficult it would be to, to, to leave the pain and the suffering behind and start a new era for the Jewish community. And that's why he added the words of his colleagues. That's why he added his introductory remark. I am like a 70 year old. Why does he have to say that? Because he wants his people to know I have been given a, a, a miraculous trust, a miraculous talent from Hashem. He raised me from a mere teenager to a level of a 70 year old. What's a 70 year old? A human being is made up of seven emotional powers. 7D means you have developed each of them to their fullest potential. 7D also is the number of the nations of the world. 7D means that this leader is poised and ready to take on for good and for bad all of the nations of the world, the whole world. That's the number 70. The number 70 represents the leader's fruition, the leader's maturation, the leader's, the pinnacle of his spiritual, mental, and, and leadership ability. We'll close with one story about the Rebbe that we heard from Professor Baranover. Uh, I think he's still alive. He was a Russian professor that was able to finally make Aliyah from the from the Soviet Union to Israel in 1972. In 1985, he was in New York visiting the Rebbe and uh, the Rebbe said to him, I need you to do me a favor and send a message to all your contacts in the Soviet Union saying, soon there will be hope. Soon you will be able to get out of there. The, the uh, communist regime is about to disappear. Professor Baranover said, I didn't, I didn't believe what I was hearing but I am an obedient chassid. And so right when the morning dawned, I called all my contacts and I relayed to them the Rebbe's message. And of course, they did not believe what I was saying. They had a very hard time accepting it. Even one Chabad chassid said, even as we speak, my wife is in a KGB prison. There's a KGB, uh, there's KGB undercover police in a car outside my apartment watching me, trying probably to eavesdrop on our conversation here. And, and my son is missing from home. Are you expecting me to believe that overnight this is all going to disappear and change? Anyway, not long afterwards, this is 1985, yes, not long afterwards, the then premier, his name was Michael uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, he announced new developments in the Soviet Union. These are words that I, I cannot pronounce. He declared Glasnost, and he declared perestroika, which means he was restructuring the government of the Soviet Union to allow greater freedom and even opening the borders and letting the Jewish people who wanted to leave or anybody who wanted to leave to leave. And anybody who wanted to come in would come in. It was a whole new world. Very shortly after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev actually went and visited Israel. And uh, he went to Be'er Sheva and he visited the university there in Be'er Sheva. And Professor Baranover was on the academic team and the academic staff in Be'er Sheva. And he tells the former or the then premier, the president of, uh, of Russia, Gorbachev, he says, you know, there's a Jewish leader in Brooklyn who's called the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And <clears throat> And, and he shared, Professor Baranover shared with the president, he said, seven years ago, he asked me to inform the Russian Jews that very soon there's gonna be a change and they're gonna be able to get out. And Gorbachev said, that's impossible. Why? Because seven years ago, this whole idea of perestroika and glosnost, glasnost, whatever, however you say those words, they were a gimmick. They were not even real. They were a gimmick to secure funding from some kind of a trade deal from the United States. Yeah, it was only afterwards that it picked up steam and eventually it accelerated out of control and it became the law of the land. 
but that was much later. Yeah, that means the Rebbe predicted it. The Rebbe saw the happy ending before Mikhail Gorbachev himself knew what path he was bound to take. What did the Rebbe have in mind for our generation? The Rebbe in his opening statement, 70 years ago, he said the, the, the job, the mission of our generation is to complete the path, to reach the end of the road that all of our history has led to. And over his 40 something years of, of teaching and leading, the Rebbe sharpened that, honed that message to a, to a fine point until in the year 1991, 1992, the Rebbe was saying Mashiach is ready to come. The world is due for the arrival of Mashiach Tzidkenu. And the Rebbe brought evidence from the world events. Yes, there's, there's good change. There is, there's wonderful transformations happening in the world without a single bullet fired, without a single shot fired. And the Rebbe brought many more examples uh, in addition to those. And since the Rebbe made that statement, 30 years have passed and the processes that the Rebbe pointed to have not ceased, they've only grown stronger. We are achieving tremendous things, yes? Tremendous things without firing a shot. The Jewish people are more respected now than they have ever been, more welcomed now than they have ever been. Yeah, not long ago, not long ago, Jews and Muslims joined together on the top of the world's tallest building, the Burj, what's it called? In, in Dubai, Burj Khalifa Tower in, in, uh, in Dubai, where Kipot and Kafiot were standing around together, shoulder to shoulder, celebrating the lighting of a menorah in the United Arab Emirates. Just now we had in the White House, a from girl and her from husband and their from children. It's unbelievable. And they were in constant contact with their Rabbonim. They were working very hard to observe the Torah and Mitzvahs to the best of their, but who ever heard of such a thing? Amazing thing. So the Rebbe, you understand, was, well, was ahead of his time, but the message is clear. Now that we have reached 70 years of the Rebbe's leadership, that means the perfect maturation of the Rebbe's leadership and of the Rebbe's mission, we can certainly say, we are ready to greet Mashiach. Good Shabbos. Thank you for joining. And now we will turn on the mics and I would love to hear your comments. <laughs>